Well, forget it. <laughs> uh, we are in our Advent series. In fact, we're starting a three-week Advent series now uh, based upon uh, the, prince, the concept called Prince of Peace. And yeah, that's Prince of Peace in Hebrew. Uh, in case you want to check, uh, of course, uh, depicting the manger scene. Uh, what we're going to be talking about today is, is one of the Old Testament prophecies that predicted the coming of Messiah, who we know to be Jesus. Um, now, last week, I, I got more feedback from last week's message than I have in a long time. And it was really good. It was, uh, it was called, If God is for us, who can be against us? Remember that? God is for you. And the idea uh, comes from Romans 8 that says, uh, so what shall we say then? If God is for us, who can be against us? God, if he didn't spare his own son, but gave his son up for us all, then, then why won't God just give us everything else? And the answer is a rhetorical yes, God will. Who is he who condemns? It's Christ who died for us. So God isn't going to condemn us. Jesus isn't going to condemn us. We're going to be found in him. And to know that God is for you can give you great uh, confidence and hope in this life that we live, to, to try to live a life to make Jesus famous here on this earth. All right, so we're moving over to the message today. Before we get started, let's ask the Lord's blessing. Heavenly Father, I thank you that you, uh, you came to earth, but not just that you came, but uh, it, there's lots of evidence that you, your coming was predicted your promise of coming was predicted long before you ever came as a babe in Bethlehem. I thank you for that promise. I thank you that it was in your plan all along to become our Savior. And Lord, we, we praise you for that. Lord, we pray for the ears to hear today. We pray that we'd tune in. We pray that we'd focus on what you have for us today. Because Lord, uh, your word tells us if any of us lacks wisdom, and how many of us need wisdom and direction in our lives? God, I know I do. So if any of us lacks wisdom, we should ask of you. Help us to remember that you are indeed our wonderful counselor. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. Today, as I said, we're going to bring, we're going to start a new series called The Prince of Peace. For those of you who have read through the scriptures, both the Christian scriptures and the New Testament and the Hebrew scriptures, the Old Testament, you know that there are a lot of names given to God and to Messiah. And each one of these names represents a unique facet of God's nature and of Christ's relationship to us as individuals and humanity as a whole. How can any of us even begin to comprehend the vastness of Jesus' characteristics and who he is as both, and this is what's so unique about Jesus, is that he was both entirely human and entirely God in one person. In fact, he's the only one who ever has been or will be, uh, have both 100% human and 100% God natures. So in this Advent series, we want to take this opportunity to dive into God's promises for his people, right? Who Christ is, where he'd be born, who he'd be born to, what he came to do while, he was, while he's here on the earth as he moves toward not just being born in a, in a lowly stable in Bethlehem, but, but actually as he ministers and on toward his final week in Jerusalem with the cross and his burial and his resurrection. And then ultimately, like Lisa and I got to see up there on Mount Olives, Mount, Mount Olives, Mount of Olives, uh, because it is a big olive grove. In fact, the Garden of Gethsemane, Gethsemane means olive press. That's where Jesus went to pray uh, that final prayer uh, of surrender to the Father's will before he was arrested. So all up there on that mountain. So here we go. One amazing fact about Jesus coming to earth as a baby in Bethlehem is that his birth, that ministry, was long predicted, long before anticipated by God's people in the Jewish scripture. So much so it was predicted by God's prophets. These prophets spoke at least 400 years before Christ. So you can't just say, well, uh, somebody predicted it and somebody came along and said, well, I'll just figure out how to fulfill all these predictions. You could not predict all these predictions of where Jesus was supposed, or where Messiah was supposed to be born. I don't know who can control the place of your own birth. You ever figure that one out? So, for example, that's just one fact. It says in the book of Hebrews that in the past to the Jewish people, God spoke in a certain way, and now in the 
in the era of the Christian faith and the church that God is speaking to us in another way. Look what it says in Hebrews. It says, in the past, this is uh, slide number four, in the past, God spoke to us. Here we go. In the past, God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets at many times and in various ways. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the universe. I think the author of Hebrews is writing and saying, just in case you keep thinking Jesus was just a human being born in Bethlehem, oh yeah, through whom he made the universe. Talking about both the divine and the human natures of Jesus. So the, the, the writer of Hebrews is saying, in the past, God spoke many times through the prophets. We're going to see that this morning. Now let me share something with you about the role of a prophet. So, so what is a prophet? A prophet in, is literally one who speaks for God. Now Samuel was the first of the prophets and the last of the judges. So Samuel is one of those guys that actually fulfilled both roles. If you know the, the history of the Israelites, after God rescued them from slavery in Egypt, they went around the desert for 40 years. Finally, they, they say you're going to go into the promised land and God is going to go before you and drive out the inhabitants. You're going to have to fight too. But if you didn't have God, you'd never conquer them because they're more powerful than you are. God brought his people into the promised land over the period of about 20, 30 years. And then Joshua, the great leader, he dies. And they go through a 400 period period. Uh, of time that's kind of sad. It's kind of sad because God's people stop being faithful to the Lord. They start going into idolatry. God says, I told you what would happen if you went into idolatry. The people said, well, we don't care until the consequences came and the consequences came. Other invaders came into the land and abused God's people. And then God would raise up a judge and the judge would be like a deliverer of God's people for a time and the people would repent and they'd get back right with God and then the whole cycle would repeat itself over and over again. Finally, after 400 years, God raises up Samuel and the people say, we want a king. And God says, uh, God is your king. And they said, that's great, but we want an earthly king because we want to be like all the other nations around us. Now, that should have been the first clue to God's people because God told them that you're going to be a peculiar people. You're going to be my treasured possession. I'm choosing the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob out of all the peoples of the earth. I'm going to, I'm going to bless you, and you're going to represent me to the rest of humanity. And the Israelites are fine as long as you bless us. You know, we don't care. You know, we're, we're fine with that. But then they didn't, they didn't obey God. So God sent the prophets. And the prophets, as I said, means one who speaks for God. So the prophet is sort of like go between God and his people. The prophet is, is, is this person. Uh, they've often been called the lawyers of the covenant, right? So the prophet would come along and he says, this is how you people are acting. So here's your behavior. And he over here, these, this is what God's standards are. So here's God's law. Here's his commandments. Here's what God expects from you how to live in order to represent him to the rest of humanity. So here's the standard of behavior, and here's how you're behaving. And it don't measure up to the standard. In fact, you guys are wicked. You're rebellious. You're stiff-necked. You're going the opposite way of what God wants you to do, and God's going to have to punish you for it. And the people are like, and, and so what would typically happen, a prophet would come along that God would raise up, and he would say, thus says the Lord, because God gave him a message to speak as the mouthpiece for God, representing God to the people, and the people, by and large, would say, we don't like your message, we don't like your judgment, we don't like your warning, we don't like you, your breath smells bad, we, we want to get rid of you. So they'd either throw him into prison, they'd kill him. Uh, the prophets did not have an easy life. Every once in a while, a prophet would come along and speak, and God's people would be cut to the heart, and they would humble themselves, and they would weep, and they would repent. And those, are, you know, those stories are, are far and few between in the, in the Jewish scriptures. So finally, God says, all right, I need to tell you, besides trying to get you to turn around, I'm going to tell you what my plan was the whole time ever since Adam and Eve sinned against God, and God said, I'm going to make one of the descendants of Eve, which is like sort of implying the virgin birth, I'm going to make one of those descendants of Eve become the Messiah, the Deliverer, the Savior of the people. 
and he's going to take care of sin, and he's going to lead God's people into where God wanted them to be the whole time, right? So God calls his prophets like Isaiah, and he says, I want you to start predicting the coming of Messiah, and I want you to start telling God's people what Messiah is going to be like so that when Jesus Messiah shows up, God's people are going to say, wow, he's acting a lot like the predictions of who Messiah says, God says Messiah is going to be, right? So here's Isaiah. He comes along. Now, let me tell you a little bit about Isaiah, right? So Isaiah is one of these Hebrew prophets. He's, in fact, he's one of the greatest of all the prophets in the scriptures. Isaiah's name, it means Yahweh is salvation. Yahweh is salvation. Pointing to people saying, you can't save yourselves. You need God to save you. Isaiah was considered to be an aristocrat, meaning that he trafficked among all the royal family and all the, the, the big wigs that were living in Jerusalem in his day, all the way from King Uzziah down to King Manasseh over a period of about 60 years. So he, was, he may have even have been of royal birth himself. Isaiah married a woman who was also a prophet. Can you imagine a prophet being married to a prophet? I can imagine. Okay, so... But Isaiah is married to a prophet, and that means their kids. Can you imagine their kids? So their kids are double PKs, right? You got double prophets' kids, right? And, and that, that just means like, woe is them, because they're going to get the thundering judgment of God coming down on them whenever they misbehave. So anyway, so their kids, and, and here's Isaiah's ministry. He's active. He's called the evangelist of the Old Testament. Now, how do you be an evangelist? Evangelist is a sharer of good news, right? The gospel is good news. So how can you be a good news sharer of the gospel way back in the Old Testament? Well, he's called the evangelist of the Old Testament because he predicts a lot of the ministry of Messiah. Even what Mary shared in her great communion talk today, she was talking about Isaiah 53, right? That was from Isaiah's scroll. So one of the, the, the other things about Isaiah that was awesome. Okay, so Lisa and I are in Israel. We're about a month ago. We're in Israel. And we come up to Jerusalem, and this was the last part of the tour. So we get three days in Jerusalem, which wasn't enough. But, but we're exploring all these things in Jerusalem. We're going to the Church of the Holy Sepulchre and the Mount of Olives, and you're going to the, the, the Holocaust Museum, the Yad Vashem. We're going, and, and one of the places they took us to was called the Shrine of the Book. And the Shrine of the Book was awesome because this was a place that encapsulated or housed a, a, a great deal of the ancient Jewish manuscripts right? They didn't care about the Christian faith so much, but they were really into the old, what we would call the Old Testament scriptures. They just call the Hebrew scriptures. So you, you've got this whole museum of all these old scrolls and books and, and manuscripts. The oldest scroll that they have in the Hebrew scriptures is called the Masoretic Text. It comes from about the year 900 after Christ, so 900 years after Christ is the absolute oldest manuscript they have of the Hebrew Scriptures. And you can imagine that because how many times have the Jewish people been persecuted over the centuries, right? And what do the persecutors love to do? But every time they conquer, they burn a synagogue, they persecute God's people, they want to take all their holy ancient scrolls and they want to burn them and get rid of them right? So that has happened over and over again to the point where, thank God that there's even some ancient scrolls left that were preserved for us to look at. So remember, up until 1947, the oldest Hebrew manuscript was 900 years before Christ, or 900 years after Christ, right? What we also did in the tour was we ended up touring down on the west coast of the west side of the Dead Sea, and on the west side of the Dead Sea, in this dry desert area, hardly any vegetation at all, looks like the landing on the moon, except it was brown. It was dry. They get two inches of rain a year, super uh, low humidity. They're always telling us, drink water so you don't dehydrate. So we go past this area, and we come to the, this community called Qumran, Qumran with a Q. And in the Qumran community, that was considered to be the... the settlement of this group of Jews who broke off from the rest of Israel. They were called the Essenes. 
and they, they wanted to be pure. They wanted to not soil themselves with the rest of God's people. They saw the rest of the Jewish people as being kind of disobedient to God and worldly. We don't want any part of that. We want to dedicate ourselves completely to God. So they left western part of Israel where the mountains are and Jerusalem and all that and they went over to the desert by the Dead Sea and they made a settlement there and for they lived there for about 300 years and they copied a lot of the scriptures and a lot of their texts for the Essene community well then the Roman army comes along when the Jews revolted against Rome in 66 AD and they had the Jewish wars and you can read all about it in Josephus's writings and the Romans came and conquered Israel. They burned Jerusalem. They destroyed the city. They burned the temple to the ground. And then they came calling uh, on the rest of Israel. And the Essenes knew the Romans were coming. They knew they were probably going to destroy their scriptures and burn everything. So they said, we got to do something about it. So the, the Essenes uh, took their scrolls. They put them in a bunch of clay jars. And they took them up into the mountains, which weren't that far away. And they were caves in the mountains, and they hid all their scrolls in these mountainous caves. Well, fast forward almost 2,000 years to a Bedouin shepherd, and he is looking for his lost goat or sheep, and he uh, is horsing around, and he sees a cave, and he decides, you know, I'm going to do target practice. You guys know all about this. Anytime, anytime you see a rock and something to throw it at, it's like, I got to do this. Right? I got to do I still have it? You know, back in my pitching days, can I throw a strike? Can I hit that on the first throw? So he throws his rock into the cave, and instead of hearing a kerplunk against the dirt or whatever, he hears this kss, and, the, and it was the crash of a clay pot being shattered by the rock. And so he says, what in the world is that? So he goes up there and explores, and you know, long story short, they find all of these ancient scrolls in these ancient pots after 2,000 years of nobody even knowing they were there. And in one of those scroll, or in one of those clay pots, was a scroll that ended up being the entire scroll of Isaiah, right? The entire scroll of Isaiah, only it wasn't from 900 years after Christ, which was the oldest scroll they had up until that time. This, this scroll was carbon dated to 100 years before Christ. So a thousand years go by between the copying of this scroll of Isaiah's prophecies to the, the, the nearest one they had, which was the Masoretic text in the year 900 AD. And you guys are, I mean, historians are going, this is amazing. The rest of you guys are going, can you get to the point? Okay, the point, the point I'm trying to get to is this. A thousand years go by, scholars hold their breath, Christians are holding their breath because we believe the, the Hebrew scriptures are the word of God just like they do. Well, what we believed was that God, when we talk about the authority of scripture and the, in, the inspiration of scripture, what we mean by that is that God's Holy Spirit supervised the writings of those prophets and the apostles so that what they wrote down in the autographs or the original writings, that was the Holy, in, Holy Spirit-inspired Word of God. It was divinely inspired, and it's useful for teaching and all that stuff that we know in the New Testament. So, if, so we believe God inspired Isaiah when he wrote it, but here's the point. I mean, this is what skeptics always like to bring up. Well, maybe God did sort of inspire the original writer, but a lot of time has gone by, and a lot of copies have been made of these scriptures, so you got to think there's going to be a lot of errors and inaccuracies, and over, over hundreds and hundreds of years and copies and copies, what is said over a thousand years later is going to be different than what was said in Isaiah's prophecy in the first century before Christ. So everybody's going like, what's it going to say? What, are the, what is this Hebrew manuscript going to say? And those of you who know the story know that ta -da -da, God comes through again because after a thousand years, the writings of a thousand years before Christ are 99.5% the same as the writings of 900 years after Christ. So a thousand years go by and the writings are like almost 100%. I mean, it was like the spelling of a word was slightly different. Or they said a word that could be translated pond instead of lake. 
You're like, okay, does that really change the whole manuscript? Oh, there's a, there's a difference after a thousand years. Yeah, this one says pond and this one says lake. <gasps> Our faith is in jeopardy. No, it's not in jeopardy. Nothing's in jeopardy. That what I get out of that, what we, what we learned, we're standing there in the Qumran community, we're going like, because God preserves his word over time. He wanted us to know what he wants us to do by revealing his word to us. So he gives us his word accurately. And we go into the shrine of the book and that 24 foot long scroll of Isaiah is wrapped completely around this big pillar in the middle of the museum. You think they thought it was important? I think so. And it was kind of brown. And I went up to it and I was like, I don't know Hebrew. What am I looking at? You know, so, uh, so I'm looking at it like I don't really understand it, but it was pretty awesome. So what we have for us today, we can be confident that this really is the word of God preserved over time. It certainly was in the thousand years before Christ and 900 years after Christ, because that's how much God wanted us to know his will for our lives through his word. All right. That's a really long story to get to Isaiah's prophecy. So let's go to Isaiah chapter 9 of this great prophetic scroll. Isaiah is predicting a glorious time in the future, right? It's bad time right now for Israel. In fact, the Assyrians are coming in. This is 700 years before Christ, 720. The Assyrian Empire is taking over the ancient world. They're coming into Israel, the northern kingdom. They're toast. They're going into conquest and captivity and exile. And Isaiah is now prophesying, and the Spirit of God says, Isaiah, you tell those Israelites that it's bad now, but it's not going to be bad forever. In fact, they're going to have a glorious future right? And that's why I titled it A Thrill of Hope. And you guys know that song, right? A thrill of hope, a weary world rejoices, right? Why? Because here's the promise. There will be a time in the future when Galilee of the Gentiles, which lies along the road that runs between the Jordan and the sea, Galilee will be filled with glory. The people who walk in darkness will see a great light. Those who live in the land of deep darkness, a light will shine. And I believe Matthew's gospel quotes this and says this is now attributed to the time of Jesus because that area of Galilee of the Gentiles was also called the land of Zebulon and Naphtali. Those were the Israelite tribes that were given that portion of land in the northern part of, of Israel. And they said that land is, is the people that were walking in darkness are going to see a great light. Well, that just happens to be the land where Nazareth is, where Jesus is born and raised. It happens to be where Cana is, where he did his first miracle. It happens to be where Capernaum and Chorazin and Bethsaida and all these places where Jesus did a bulk of his Christian ministry. Those who walk in darkness will see a great light. And so God fulfilled that promise in Jesus right there. Now he goes on to the great, this great chap, uh, this great verse six, which is where I, I was intending to get to. It was after a rather lengthy introduction, but you can't say a word about it. <laughs> uh, number one, for a, for a child is born to us. This is Isaiah nine, verse six. A child is born to us, a son is given to us. The people who walk in darkness are going to see a great light. You're going to have hope. The future is going to be bright for Israel. How? A child is going to be born to us? A son is going to be given to us? Okay, fine. And, of course, that's, he's not going to stay a baby. The government will rest on his shoulders. Now, when I say the government will rest on his shoulders, that means that whoever this character is, this child to be born, when he grows up, he will assume the mantle of the rightful authority of God to rule, right? Now, interesting, fast forward to Jesus as he's getting ready to ascend into heaven. He's with his disciples, and he says to them right before he says, the Great Commission, everybody knows the Great Commission? You know my old joke, what's the Great Commission? Oh, I don't know. Nine, ten percent? No, that's not the Great Commission. The Great Commission is where Jesus says, go and make disciples of all nations, right? So right before Jesus says that, what does Jesus say about himself now that he's risen from the dead in his resurrection body, uh, victorious over death, victorious over sin, the conquering hero? He says, all authority on heaven and earth has been given to me. So Jesus says all authority has been given to him. He didn't just, wasn't just born with this promise. He fulfilled the promise. The government will rest 
on his shoulders. And go on uh, later on in the, in the verse, and now he's going to have four names. And, and he says, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Now, what I thought was, okay, I just read a son will be born, a child will be given to us, and these are the names he's going to have. Now, if it's just a human being, how can any human being have all of these, have all these qualities, have all these attributes? How could a human being, okay, wonderful counselor. Oh, he'll be a wise counselor. He will have a lot of wise things to say. He will have a lot of, of great direction for God's people. Yeah, that could be a good and wise king. Maybe even David could fulfill that one. But how about these other names? Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And then you go on to say, and it gets worse if the son to be born is just a human being because it says... Uh, the government will rest on his shoulders. It says um, that he's going to uh, inherit a kingdom that will never end. And when this uh, son to be born, this wonderful counselor starts to rule, his rule is never going to end. It's going to last forever. And no human being could uh, fulfill that. It, it would have to be somebody who was divine. Isaiah, Isaiah's prophetic message obviously was fulfilled in the person of Jesus Christ. And in the next weeks, we're going to talk about these four names of Messiah. Today, we're going to talk about Wonderful Counselor. Wonderful Counselor. Now, that's the name that expresses Messiah's ability to be a guide, to be a leader, to, have, to make wise decisions, to be the one who's the living word, to be the person who's the infallible source of guidance. The, he's going to have inexhaustible wisdom. He's going to have truth with a capital T, reality. He's going to be able to spell out reality for all of us, and he's going to show us the way to go. He's going to fulfill all of that in the, in the name of Wonderful Counselor. Now, i got to stop and ask you guys this. How many of you ever came to a place in your life where you needed direction, where you needed advice? You, you came to a fork in the road, and Yogi Bear's advice wasn't good enough. Yogi Bear, oh, Yogi Bear, when you come to a fork in the road, take it. Thanks, Yogi. You know, that's what Boo Boo said. Anyway, uh, but thanks, Yogi, for advice that really isn't advice at all, right? So when you do come to a place of direction, you say, God, I don't know what to do here. I don't know what place to go. I don't know which is the right direction. And sometimes it has been said, this is kind of a proverb that's been around for years now, the good is often the enemy of the best. So you can have, even have a possibility of a direction that looks good, sounds good, but isn't necessarily God's best for you or the direction God wants you to go. So how do you know which way to go? How do you know the right decision to make? Well, it certainly would be great to have a wonderful counselor that you could go to to point you in the right direction. And thank God we have that in Jesus. God gave us in Jesus a perfectly wonderful counselor. Look what it says in Isaiah chapter 28 later on. God is making all these promises. He says, all this comes from the Lord Almighty, whose plan is wonderful, whose wisdom is magnificent. And again, Isaiah says, this is attributed to the Lord Almighty. And yet in Isaiah chapter 9, it says, a son is going to be born to us, a child will be given, and he will be called or named Wonderful Counselor. So somehow the Lord Almighty in this human baby to be born are intimately connected. All this is from the Lord Almighty. Wonderful counselor, gives supernatural wisdom. Uh, many people would hear Jesus speak. I mean, you, you talk about somebody who speaks with wisdom, somebody that when he taught, everybody just stopped in their tracks and said, wait a second, this isn't like any of the other. They had rabbis in their day in Israel. They had teachers of the law. They had scribes. They had the priests. They had a lot of people who had most of the Jewish scriptures memorized. And yet when Jesus would come along, look at the end of the Sermon on the Mount. It says, after Jesus finished speaking, the crowds were amazed at his teaching. For he taught as one who had real authority, quite unlike the teachers of religious law. If I were a scribe back in that day and I read that, I'd be like, ouch. <laughs> You're talking about me. Uh, I don't, have the, I don't have the wisdom that Jesus has. 
Now, there are times, I, and you guys probably can recall a time in your life when you met somebody who in a certain area was really wise. Now, nobody's wise in every area, but, but certain people have expertise in certain fields of study. So, like when I want to fix something or I want to repair something, don't, and, and I'll, I'll just give you a wise word of wisdom right now. You want to fix something or repair something, I'll tell you who not to go to. Don't go to me because you're not going to get wisdom. You're going to get ignorance and no experience and uh, help after about five minutes of frustration and maybe something that was broken worse than when you started. So I'm not the person to go to for, for in that particular way. But Raul Guerra, would I go to Raul if I wanted to fix something or I had an idea about something that needed to be repaired or built? I'd go to Raul in a heartbeat because I know he has expertise. I know he has wisdom in that area. A certain person who's wise in an area knows things. They're an expert. And you and I could learn a lot from that person about that particular topic, right? If I, if I wanted to know about nursing and hospital care, I'd go to you, Kathy. I wouldn't go to Lisa, even though I'd go to you for other things. Okay, so I'm not, you know, you know I'm not putting you down, right? All right, got to check because I'll get it out. I'll get, Sunday afternoon is going to be bad if I don't fix that one. So thank you for indulging me. Uh, we, when you find somebody who's wise in a certain area, you, and you need to know what, some of what they know in order to get done something that you need to get done, you find yourself gravitating toward that person. You find yourself attracted to that person. You want to spend time with that person. You want to, quote, pick their brain, so to speak, to learn what they need so you can do what you need to do. Well, Jesus, look what Paul says about Jesus in, in, the, in the book of Colossians. They said, keep Paul's like, keep on growing in your faith. Keep on developing it. Keep on realizing that. Do you realize what you have in Jesus? It says, in Christ are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. In Christ are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. So when I need wisdom and direction, I'm going to the wonderful counselor. I'm going to the one who has the most wisdom and the most direction. And, and he actually invites us to come to him. In Hebrews, we come boldly to his throne of grace. In the book of James, he says, if any of you lacks wisdom, what are we supposed to do? Wallow in your ignorance. No, that is not what the scripture says. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God. It's not that hard. It does re I'll tell you what it does require. It requires humility. It requires I don't know. It, it could require I am wrong in the, whatever I thought was the, was the right way to go about doing this thing. I have failed. I, I'm stuck. I, I, need, I, I need direction, God. I need a way out. I need a way forward. I need a way through. And God, you're the one who has wisdom. So I'm going to you. And I'm trusting because of your character. You say, first of all, God is for us. Remember last week? God is for us. Who can be against us? Who is he condemns? Nah, you're not going to condemn me. You're going to be for me. So, and now you say, who gives generously to all and without finding fault. We can get wisdom and direction for what we need from God. Look, I was going to point you to the banner that says, trust in the Lord with all your heart. You remember that was what used to be up there until some decorating elf came along and threw up a new banner, which is really beautiful, by the way, but it is, oh, come let us adore him. But for weeks, I used to look up there and I'd say, if I ever get stuck, I'm just going to point there and say, you know what? Whatever I said, just do that. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. And here's the thing about wisdom, right? If Jesus is the one in whom are, are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge, if he's the wonderful counselor that is promised in Isaiah, then Jesus is going to be the one who can, when I trust in him and I don't lean on my own understanding, when I acknowledge him in all my ways, he's the one who's going to straighten my path. He's the one who's going to make my path straight. And he's going to make your path straight if you're willing to come to him. If you're willing to, quote, not lean on your own understanding. And of course, there's the rub, as the Brits say. Do not lean on your own understanding. I don't know where you go for direction, wisdom, information, how to do things in life. I know a lot of... I, I, I can tell you in the digital information age and we live in the 21st century, there are more sources of, quote, knowledge, direction, and wisdom than you could shake a stick at. You can go a lot of different ways to find direction in your life. 
None of them are, none of them in and of themselves are Jesus. So what I, I want to say to you is what it takes is it, it, first of all, it takes an attitude of saying, Lord, I don't know. I would like to know, but I don't know myself and all my attempts at trying to find the way to go, all my self help attempts, all my attempts at asking other people who don't have divine wisdom, like one person used to say, why are you asking dead people to tell you how to live, right? So I, if I'm going a bunch of different ways of trying to find uh, a path forward that'll be the best direction for my life, I finally, some, some people have to get to the end of the rope and they have to get to the end of the road and they have to say, God, I've tried every which way and none of them have turned out the right way. I'm looking to you. And, and if you get to that point where you're no longer leaning on your own understanding, God's like, good, because now we can talk. And now I can show you divine wisdom. And, now, and, and look, what, look what it promises. In slide number 15, uh, it, there's a, uh, as Isaiah goes down in the prophecy, and he says, how does a wise Messiah act? What are we going to get from this wise Messiah? First of all, we're going to get a pathway to live. We're going to get, we're going to get a modeling, an example for the way to live. Look what, G, look what Messiah does. It says, Messiah, he will delight in obeying the Lord. He will not judge by appearance. He won't make a decision based on hearsay. Wow. <laughs> Tell our hearings that. Okay, um, uh, I'm going to skip that. Uh, now, verse number four. He will give justice to the poor and make fair decisions for the exploited. Talk about, it's not just wise to say, okay, what's the right answer here? What's the wrong answer? I mean, that, there's a certain amount that is good for knowledge. But you know, knowledge is, only, is very limited. In fact, Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 8, Paul says, knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. You can get so much knowledge that it, 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 you can lose your humility as you gain in knowledge. Have anybody discovered that? Have anybody met people like that? They're educated beyond their intelligence. They're educated where they've got a lot of knowledge, but they don't seem to have a lot of wisdom. They've got a lot of learning, but they don't seem to have a lot of common sense. And it's like, wait a minute, it's, it's wisdom. When you, when you talk about wisdom in the Bible, wisdom in the Christian faith, it's wisdom for living. It's not wisdom to say, uh, what's the shortest verse in the New Testament? <laughs> John eleven thirty five. 35, Jesus wept. By the way... <laughs> It's kind of funny, but our daughter-in-law was in a group of high schoolers in her youth group, and she said, does anybody know a verse from the Bible? And uh, this, this one girl raised her hand like, ooh, 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 I know, I know. And, and they said, okay, what was the verse? And he says, it's, I think it's the shortest verse, too. It says, Jesus cried. <laughs> I was like, you had two words to remember, and you got one of them wrong. So <laughs> it's just... It's one of those moments where you had to be there. We all laughed hysterically. Those of you who are in the ministry, it's kind of funny. All right. Uh, and it's also kind of sad. It's like, how far do we have to go to disciple these people? All right. So, uh, so Jesus is, is delighting and obeying the Lord. He's, he's acting in all these godly ways. And when he gets wisdom, we ask God for it, to be in the company of, to be in his company of someone who's wise, uh, those who walk with the wise become wise. You remember that? That's one of the Proverbs. If you walk with the wise, you will become wise. So who you hang out with is probably who you're going to become more like. We, they say choose your friends because your friends choose your future. You choose friends who are wise, you will be more likely to become wise. You choose friends who are ignorant, and you will likely follow in those footsteps as well. So what we're trying to learn to do is to follow this wonderful counselor, follow the Messiah in whom are hidden all wisdom and knowledge, who delights in obeying the Lord. And, and now we come down to uh, the last verses that I'm going to share, which is how do you get wisdom? So how do you go about getting wisdom in the Jewish scriptures? Do you realize there's a whole book in the, the Jewish scriptures that is all about wisdom? Anybody know what the book is called? Proverbs, right? Proverbs is the book of wisdom. Proverbs, I don't know about you, but when I was a teenager and I said, I've never read the Bible before, you know, this is a big book. Where do you want me to start? And uh, the youth pastor said, start with the book of Proverbs. To a 15-year-old kid, start in Proverbs. You know, I would rewind the tape and I would say, how about the gospel of John? How about Matthew, Luke, you know, where I could learn more about Jesus? 
But somehow she had some wisdom because in her discernment, she said, Proverbs is something you really need. Right now, where you are in your life, you read the book of Proverbs. So you read, according to Proverbs 2, what are you going to get by reading Proverbs? Look what the author says. Tune your ears to wisdom. Concentrate on understanding. Cry out for insight. Ask for understanding. Search for them. Search for wisdom and understanding as you would for silver, for treasure, for the most valuable thing on earth. They said, the, pro, the writer of Proverbs says, if you get wisdom, you're going to have more than, than these kinds of riches. Seek them, seek wisdom like hidden treasures. And I'm sitting there going, okay, wisdom is, is the best thing you can have in your life, more so than all this other stuff. So what will happen when we turn our hearts to God? What will happen when we ask God for wisdom and understanding? Right? So what does he promise? He goes on in, the, in Proverbs chapter 2. He says, then you will understand what it means to fear the Lord. Fear the Lord has something to do with wisdom. You read Proverbs 1, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. So there's that. And you'll gain knowledge of God for the Lord grants wisdom. Thank God, because I, you know, I need it. We all need wisdom. We all need to know the difference between right and wrong. We all need to know, okay, what would Jesus do? And not just think about meh, what we think Jesus might do, but according to what we know, the way Jesus acted, the way he taught, the way he treated people, the way he lived, what would Jesus do based upon his wisdom in his word, right? So the Lord grants wisdom. From his mouth comes knowledge and understanding. He grants a treasure of common sense to the honest. He's a shield to those who walk with integrity. In other words, you're going to have God's protection. He guards the path of the just. He protects those who are faithful to him. I'm liking that kind of protection. What are the benefits of listening to our wonderful counselor? He goes on. I'm going to finish up with this in Proverbs 2. Then you will know what is right and just and fair, and you will find the right way to go. For wisdom will enter your heart, knowledge will fill you with joy, wise choices will watch over you. Like here, God's protecting us with his wisdom that he's willing to give us if we'll humble ourselves and ask him and not lean on our own understanding, but trust him instead. Wise choices will watch over you. Understanding will keep you safe, right? In Christ are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. We were in a prayer meeting this morning at 8 o'clock. And of course, what happens is I always get the best verse that I didn't think of during the week as I'm prepping the sermon. But it's like, better late than never. So at 8.15, this verse comes to mind where Paul, and I ought to know this because it's in Timothy, but in 2 Timothy 3.15, Paul looks back over Timothy's life and he says, Timothy, you've got a great advantage, right? First of all, you had a godly mother. You had a godly grandmother. They taught you the scriptures. It says, Timothy, from infancy, you've known the holy scriptures, the scriptures that will make you wise for salvation through your faith in Jesus. Knowing the scriptures has the opportunity to make somebody wise for salvation. What's the difference? When I said the opportunity, what's the difference between becoming wise and not becoming wise? You could sit in church week after week after week and you could still not become wise based upon what Jesus said at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, right? He said, whoever hears these words of mine and puts them into practice, there's the man or the woman who builds his house on the rock, right? So when the storms come, you're going to be able to withstand whatever comes down the life because you built your house on the rock. So hearing Jesus' word and putting them into practice, that's the difference between knowledge and wisdom. You can win a Bible trivia contest and still not have any wisdom from God because all you did was take in the scriptures, but you didn't apply them to your life. So there is a humility that precedes wisdom. There is this idea of not leaning on your own understanding, of saying, God, you know better than I how to live life. So I'm going to trust in you rather than in me. And when I trust in you and I humble myself and I say, I'm going to follow your ways, not my own ways. Jesus, you're the best way to live. Jesus, you're the only way to die. I'm going to gain wisdom. And when you start gaining wisdom, then Jesus is going to fulfill 
that promise that he said way back in Isaiah 9, 700 years before Christ was born, that Messiah would be named Wonderful Counselor. And he could be your Wonderful Counselor. <clears throat> Friends, I don't know if the time has come for you today. Worship team, I don't know where are you guys. Hannah, you guys back in the back? Okay. You got 17 rows to get up to the front. I counted. <laughs> I remember first coming to this church. How many people seats? The, you know, we can, we can sit 255 people in this room. We could get 200 people probably fairly close to each other where you know each other's aftershave if we pack this place out this next week for the Adore Christmas program. So it's, it's all about getting excited for God, getting excited about Jesus being the Messiah, getting excited about him being the one who came to save those who were caught in their sins. And I don't know where you are in your life today. The Apostle Paul reflects on the coming of Jesus. He's reflecting on God's timing. Like, God, why did you send Jesus when you sent Jesus? You know, Jesus could have come at any time, but why did he come in the first century? Why did he come in the middle of the Roman Empire? Why did he come to Israel and Bethlehem? And Paul looks back and he says, for at just the right time, in God's timing, his kairos, not just time that's like minutes and hours and days, but in God's timing, when the right time came for the fulfillment of prophecy, for Isaiah 9 to come true, God sent his son, born of a woman, subject to the law, God sent him to buy freedom for us who were slaves to the law so that he could adopt us as his very own children. You know, when I said God is for you, God is for you because that's exactly what God wants to do for you. He wants to set you free, to buy freedom for you who were slaves to sin, to adopt you into his very own family. And I don't know if you... Think of Jesus in that way. I don't know if today is the right time for you because at the right time God sent Jesus, but there's also a right time in every person's life when they realize, when you realize that Jesus isn't just a prophet or a teacher or a wise person or a good man, but Jesus is much more than that. He is the long predicted son of God, son of man, Come as a baby in Bethlehem to be your savior. Coming to be your wonderful counselor if you would only humble yourself and invite him to be that. And so I want to bow our heads and I want to say a prayer. And if, if that's where you are right now, then we're going to pray together. So let's pray. And wherever you are in your life, if, you, if you're ready not, ju not just to celebrate Jesus' birth, but if you're ready to embrace Jesus' authority, when he said the government will rest on his shoulders, that was saying that Jesus has the rightful authority from God Almighty to rule. He has the rightful authority to rule all of our lives, but he only rules the lives of those who choose to let him rule their lives. He says he'll bless you. He says he'll, he'll give you wisdom and knowledge from on high, that he will show you the best way to live if you would only humble yourself and allow him in. And so, Lord Jesus, today, we're coming to you in faith. We know that you are not just a baby born in Bethlehem, not a random birth in Israel in the first century. Lord Jesus, you were long predicted. You were long awaited. The, the world, the weary world, and Israel was waiting for you to come. And God sent you in his timing at just the right time to rescue us. For you will give him the name Jesus and he will save his people from their sins. Today, I want to be one of those people. Lord, I'm turning around from whatever direction I was going in my life. I'm coming back to you in humble faith. And I'm putting my trust in you today. And I'm saying, Jesus, be my savior, be my Lord, be the leader of my life. I choose to follow you. And God, thank you for all your promises that if, if we would trust in Jesus, we would have eternal life. We would have forgiveness. We would have the hope for the future. And we would have your Holy Spirit to empower us to live a life that you always dreamed that we would live. Thank you for all your great promises. Thank you that you are our wonderful counselor.
counselor. And we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand.